John 21, the last chapter. We'll begin with verse 15 and read to the end. John 21, 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joan, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my lambs. Again, Jesus said the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Truly, I tell you, When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Jesus turned. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray us? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that, that this disciple would not die. Jesus did say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that this testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. If I was to finish the Gospel of John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I would have put a plug in for, Lord, I'd like a different ending. Um, My wife has rubbed off on me. She always asks me if I've seen a movie first, does it have a happy ending? If it doesn't have a happy ending, she says, I'm not starting it. I get enough real life, she says, I don't need, you know, sad, crazy, dumb endings in a movie where, you know, somebody dies that I don't want to die. And so if, if she's kind of influenced me, and so I would have rewritten this differently. It would have gone something like this. And Jesus comes together with Peter and he asks him the three questions. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Then feed my sheep. I would like that part. And then even the part where Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you know, there was a day when you denied me just in an association relationship with me. But there's going to come a day that your hands are going to be stretched out. Not of your own accord, somebody else. They're going to dress you, and they're going to mock you just like they did me, and you're going to die for the glory of God. Peter, I'm with you, and this life in you that the Holy Spirit is going to bring about is going to be a great testimony to the rest of the world. The end. That's how I would have finished it. Why? Because I would like Peter to get his act together one time and not mess up. I would have liked Peter to kind of finish strong. But what does he do? He's Peter. And he succumbs to one of the the easiest 
tools of the enemy in the world. It's one that you and I face every day. It can sideline you, distract you, take you completely off course as it did Peter. Peter's going along, he gets restored, he gets commissioned by Christ. No small thing. Called into ministry, told what to do. And what does Peter do? He turns his head and he begins to compare his life to John's. And he starts telling Christ, I'd just as soon run the world. Because if you're going to ask me to suffer, I want him to suffer too. Because in a weird way, we don't mind suffering as long as we have friends to do it with. But if I have to go it alone, if I have to do something that my friends don't have to do, God, that's not fair. I want to rewrite this story. I want to talk to you this morning as we finish John's gospel. It's been a beautiful time together. About 11 months we've been in it. How to slay this demon called comparison. Because my friends, if you don't slay it, it will get you. It has taken so many people out. It's very simple. It's probably one of the easiest tools that the enemy has in your life. And so I want to see it in Peter, but I also want to help us know how to defend against it. Where does it begin? It begins simply with Christ's invitation. This is not new to Peter. He's heard it before. He heard it, Luke chapter five records it, when Jesus was interacting with him on that day he was fishing. It's recorded in Matthew's fourth chapter and Jesus says, Peter, I want you to come and follow me. Now I absolutely believe that the gospel is very simple. Jesus Christ, who is God, came in the flesh, died a sinless and lived a sinless life and died for you and rose again and offered you as we just celebrated his body, his blood, that you might be saved. That is the gospel. But you also can't miss that Christ said to Peter and to you, come follow me. In fact, he gets a little more graphic. I want you to take up your cross and follow me. I want you to sacrifice I want you to lay your life down. Peter, I want you to abandon what you were going to do. I want you to give up the nets. I want you to give up the boats. And we're going to go fish, not for fish, but for people. And, and by the way, I, I don't think we should alter the gospel. Of course not. But let's not so remove the strength and the teeth of Christ's invitation. Yes, all it takes is the simple belief in Christ and you are transformed. But along with that transformation comes an invitation and that is what? Come follow me. The invitation to all of us is follow me. It's what Christ gave to you. It's not get fire insurance, go do what you wanna do. It's not I'll save you and you just go live your life. No, that's nowhere in the Bible. Does Christ ever say, I'd like to save you and you just go live like the devil, I don't care. No, he he says, come and I'm gonna indwell you with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna transform your heart. I am gonna transform your mind. I am gonna re kind of uh, shift all of your appetites and I'm gonna give you an appetite for that which is righteous. I'm gonna call you out of drunkenness I'm going to call you out of your own flesh. I'm going to call you out of sexual immorality. Come follow me. And I think actually Peter was in for that. I do. I don't see any hint in this scripture that Peter was when Jesus actually comes to him and tells him some pretty stiff stuff. It's right there in following 18 and follow. He says, I tell you the truth. When you're younger, you used to dress yourself. But when you get older, no. And he's not talking about the fact that you're going to go into a nursing home and you can't dress yourself. He's talking about, Peter, your arms are going to be stretched out. And there's really not a church historian that doesn't agree that what Jesus is describing is Peter's martyrdom. That he's going to be crucified. And nowhere in the text does Peter say, are you kidding me? I'm going to have to die for you? No, it's not there. I'll tell you what is there, though. Peter's head turns, 
And this is where he fails. And he fails because it's one of the simplest and most profoundly successful tools that the enemy wants to use in your life today. All he wants you to do is to turn your head. That's what Peter did. It's recorded in verse 20. Peter turned and he saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. That's John. Jesus and Peter were having a conversation. They were walking. It was beautiful. He was being restored. He was being commissioned. He was being called out. He was told, you're going to be the the individual who are going to shepherd my sheep. Peter, you're going to be the folks, the guy that's going to lead. It's going to be like, uh, I'm commissioning you to be the elder of the elders, if you will. And instead of receiving that and accepting that, Peter turns his head. And when he turns his head, what catches his attention? John. The danger for all of us is comparison. And there's a number of things that happen. Number one, it makes you feel less. It makes you less than who you are. It makes you as a person begin to struggle with things where competition begins to define you. In her book, Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown talks about swimming. Some of you are swimmers and you go to the pool and you get in those lanes and you start swimming. I've done some of that um, and and I'm not overly fast, but the reality is um, my wife tells me I'm slightly competitive. That's an understatement. So I'll get in that swimming pool and I'll start swimming and all of a sudden out of my eye, there comes somebody else over there. Now, I don't know that person. I don't know their age. I don't know anything about them because they jumped in the pool after me. But something triggers inside of me that, you know what? They can't beat me. (laughs) Now, the likelihood is they can, but in my mind, I'm Mark Spitz. And, and, and I'm like, I'm going to be, and I start to stretch out my stride and, and, and the arthritis in my left shoulder reminds me, hey, dude, you're, you're not Mark Spitz. But, but something happens in competition and it makes you either envious of that individual or smug when you beat them. Sometimes it can be flat out straight uh, humiliating. I probably have told some of you this story years ago when Carrie and I lived in Colorado, we did this thing called Ride the Rockies. It was just a beautiful week. We would get uh, on our bike and we would ride 60, 70, sometimes 100 miles and we'd do a pass every day. And one day I was going up this pass and minding my own business just in my own little, and at my size, you don't go up hills fast. You go down really fast. Um, but I was, I was cruising along and just like in the stride, you know, just going up. It was, it was a rabbit ears pass and it was about an eight mile run up. And I was like, you know what? Lock and load. Here we go. And along comes this about 75 year old woman and she gets up way too close. It's in my personal space. And, and she looks over and, and she says in the kindest voice, honey, how are you doing? Now, I know I get flush in the face pretty easily. If I go outside in a little wind, I look like, you know, I'm going to die. And so I, I, but I'm to the point where breathing and speaking a little bit beyond me at that point. So I, I, I go, you know, kind of like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Kind of like, get out of my space, just go. And she decides to pace me for a little while. So we're kind of going along and, and she's not even breathing. And uh, with all my might, I wanted to take a bungee cord and just wrap it around her bike and say, have at it, honey, go get them. So she paces for a little while, too long for my liking. And then finally, I think she just got bored and she says, you're going to make it, honey, keep going. <laughs> with everything in my fiber, I wanted to throw my water bottle in her sprocket. Yeah. <laughs> How is it that a 75-year-old woman can make me want to throw my bike over the cliff? It's comparison. It's really easy. That's all the enemy has to do is to get your eyes off of what you're doing and get them onto somebody else. And what happens is if you beat them, you become smug 
And if they beat you, you become envious. And that's what was happening to Peter. He wasn't in competition, but his theory was, God, if I'm going to suffer, what about him? If I have to send my kids to the mission field, what about those guys? If I have to struggle and one of my children are going to become prodigals and they're going to go off the edge, then what about my brother? It's this weird thing inside of us that if I have to suffer, I'm okay with it as long as somebody else I know, they have to suffer as well. I don't delight. Jesus was talking about John and he comes back to Peter and says, hey, if I want to do something with John, it's kind of up to me. And that's the insidiousness of this. It's because what Peter is really asking is, Lord Jesus, would you get off the throne and let me run the world? Would you quit being God for a moment and let me decide who's going to suffer? And I'm happy to suffer for you, but John better suffer as well. It makes you feel less. Less of who you are. And it creates this unbearable tension inside of you. Brown talks about in her book, the tension of life is I want to belong and I want to stand out. I want to belong to a community and I want to be a poppy seed and rise above. And that tension is always felt in comparison. I I, I want to belong to this group of people but I'd like them to notice I'm a step above them. I I, I want to have a place to call home, but when I walk in the door, I want everyone to applaud. It creates an unbearable tension. It does. Brown, in her study in this book, identifies that when we compare, it always leads to a number of things. Fear, fear, Anger, shame, and a sadness. Here's the sadness. Peter is no longer allied with Christ. He's actually asking Jesus to take a step aside. He's no longer allied with his friend. He's actually asking God to make John suffer. What about him? If I have to stretch my arms out, is he too? I mean, if I have to stand up there on a cross, let's make sure there's two or three of them and John can go. How about James, your half-brother? It creates this unbearable tension that I want to belong to this group of people and I want to remain friends with you, Jesus, but I want to stand out. I want to run the world. And it causes us to break our stride. Peter and Jesus were cruising. They were. They were headed somewhere and they were being commissioned. Peter was being commissioned. And all of a sudden, Peter pauses for a moment and he stops the movement and he turns and his focus is no longer on the calling and the commissioning of Christ. It's on his friend John. That's what happens to you when you start comparing your life. You take your eye off of the prize. You take your eye off of your calling. You you lose the uniqueness of your own life and you forget what Christ has called you to. And now you're looking this way or that way. And now you're distracted and you're off step. You're, You're no longer pursuing God. You're actually arguing with God about running the world. It causes us to break our stride. Peter turned, hey, what are you turning for, Peter? I'm looking at him. This week I was chatting with a friend who'd just gone to the airport. He was down. And, and he explained to me, he says, I'm, I'm down because um, every year when our kids are home, I got to take them back to the airport, put them on the airplane. And I watch my kids go and I watch my grandkids go and I think to myself, I I hope to see you in a year. And he said, that's always just like the roughest day for me. 
And as he was describing that, he, he, he started asking me some questions and I didn't even want to tell him about my grandkids. I didn't want to tell him that I see them regularly because I knew and I know that sometimes the enemy can slip in there and something that is really beautiful that your kids are called to serve in another country and they're doing really well and they're making a difference for Christ, but it hurts when you drop them off at the airport. And you're willing to hurt as long as somebody else hurts with you. You're willing to hurt as long as there's another grandfather that drives home with you that cries because his grandkids are gone too. It causes us to break our stride and to take our eyes. And maybe worse, the comparison stops you from enjoying what you have. Peter was being commissioned by Christ. Peter was being called into ministry, entrusted, restored, and he is arguing with God about running the world. He's not celebrating his calling. He's not improving his gift mix. He's not asking Christ about prayer strategies to lead his team. He's not asking Christ to help him shape the focal points of his preaching. He's asking God to make his friends suffer. And it all comes very simply because in a moment of beauty, the enemy slips in. Carrie and I were, um, over this weekend, we were celebrating with a group of friends that uh, we ministered together 40 years ago at Oregon State, and somebody had the idea of just kind of bringing us all back together, and it was, it was really a delightful time. We, we were together Friday night and part of yesterday, and uh, these folks were from all over the place. I mean, they came in from Houston and, and Boston and Florida. And, um, there's some, some wonderful people in this group, uh, vice president of, of a mission organization and another vice president of another mission organization and some folks that have served around the world. It's just really in, wonderful people. And we were sitting around talking. It was a group of us, a smaller group of the 50. And uh, they started talking about um, retirement. And uh, I was the only one in the group uh, that wasn't retired. And they were talking about how excited they were. One guy was like, yeah, I retired at 60. Another guy says, yeah, I retired about 50. I, I worked for this company in China. I can't tell you what I did. It's illegal now. It was legal at the time. Um, and he said, I made so much money. I just decided to come back and retire. It's really cool. You can do whatever you want to do. And this uh, other retired professor, brilliant, brilliant uh, professor, she looked at me and she goes, you know, come into the retirement waters, Mark. The water is fine. You can do whatever God wants you to do. And I was like, I guess I thought I was kind of doing that. <laughs> and, and the next thing I know, these are lovely people. They are. They're good friends. I mean, lifetime friends, 40-year friends. And the next thing you know, these little demons kind of circled up the table and kind of went after me and tried to figure out why my financial planner was not getting me into retirement. And, and, and how I would be free to serve God and do whatever I wanted to do if I could just retire. And I found myself kind of getting defensive and, and realizing that the, the temptation in that moment was as real as Peter's. Would you get your eyes off of your calling and turn your head and start comparing yourself and I got news for you. If I would have compared myself to, to a lot of these friends, I'd have come up wanting. I mean, one guy retired at 50. Uh, another guy is, is a vice president of, of PG&E. I mean, he has a monthly you know, lunch with Warren Buffett. He could have retired 20 years ago. 
And when the enemy comes in and he says, I just want you to turn your head for a moment. And I want you to find somebody. And here's the two directions he wants you to look. He wants you to find somebody that you're better than so you can feel smug, successful. And then he wants you to find somebody that's better than you so that you can feel envious and jilted by God. And if he can get you to turn your head, he's whooped you. In that moment, he's whooped you. Because he's taken your focus off of your calling. He's taken your focus off of your gifting. He's taken your focus off of the invitation of Jesus. Come follow me. If I want John to live forever, that's my call, Jesus said. If I want somebody to have every one of their grandkids around them the rest of their life, that's my call. If I want somebody else to go cancer-free the rest of their life, that's my call. If I want somebody else to live for 70 years together as a couple and Jesus says, I'm going to let them live in happily ever after matrimony, that's my call. But if your husband dies when you're 50, then Jesus says, that's my call. That's my call. What he's really saying to Peter is, Peter, I'll play God. You play Peter. Comparison stops you. And it gets your eyes off of the glory and the beauty of what God has called you to. And it gets you comparing to people. And inevitably, you're always going to find somebody that you're better than so that you can feel smug. And successful. And you're going to find somebody that you're worse than. Or, and, and it's not even economic. It can be one person has three children and all of them are walking with God. And you have three children and one of them's walking with God. And you're feeling as you compare. Why them? Why God are all of their kids walking with God? We, we had family devotions and you start going down this pathway of justification and rationalization and trying to figure out where did we go wrong? More importantly, God, where did you go wrong? Why? The invitation and the destruction for all of us is when we turn our head. And so what's the answer? How do you slay that demon, that demon called comparison? Jesus has it right here. It's in verse 22. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Just follow me, Peter. Follow me. Get out of bed and follow me. Take up your cross Let's go. I got a life for John. It's going to be a good life. But if you follow me, your life will be fulfilling. If you follow me, your life will have a humility to it, but an impact that you will never imagine. If you follow me, I will use you to make a difference and I will stretch your faith. And it will be more than worth it to you, Peter. It will be something so glorious. You'll honor God. And when you get to heaven, you will stand before God and John won't be there and nobody else will be there. James won't be there. Matthew won't be there. Peter, you'll be there. And in that moment, Jesus will look. I will look at you, Peter, and I will say, well done. Not because you lived your life differently than John, but because you followed me. And you lived your unique and glorious and beautiful life just follow me. Just follow me, Peter. Don't compare. There are going to be people in this church who live an easier life than you do. Just follow Jesus. There will be people in this church who retire better than you. Just follow Jesus. 
There will be people in this church that have it harder than you. More of their kids will rebel. Just follow Jesus. There will be people in this church who make the the best decisions they know how to make and their life is challenging. Just follow Jesus. There will be people who launch ministries and they're going to succeed and yours is going to struggle along and you're going to wonder what's wrong and you're going to go down all of the analysis and you're going to come to the conclusion like Peter, Jesus, I'd like to run the world today. And Jesus is going to say to you, just follow me. I had a conversation with one of the brothers uh, at this reunion. He came up to me and he said, I just want to thank you for giving me one of the best uh, bits of advice I've ever been given. And it's like, really? I don't have a clue what I said to you. And he said, I I was dating this lady, it's his wife. And he goes, I I was going to break up with her. And before I broke up with her, I thought, let me go and hang out with Mark and see what he thinks. And and he said, man, you you told me some things. And he goes, I I took them to heart and I, I honored them. And I'll tell you, it was the best decision I ever made. And I was like, huh, I don't even remember that we met have no clue what I said. It must have been all Jesus. It must have been all Jesus. See, that's what happens. If you get your eyes off of people and you quit trying to tell God how to run the world, you will find yourself making a difference in ways that you never imagined. Might not always be easy. Sometimes you might have to go to the airport and drop your kids and your grandkids off. Sometimes you might have to make your way to the doctor and struggle with MS. Sometimes you have to be the person that deals with tragedy. Sometimes you have to be the person that goes to bed every night wondering where your kids are because they don't talk to you. And if you turn your head, you're going to find somebody in this church who's all their kids are doing great. And you're going to feel like a miserable failure. Other times you're going to have three of your kids and they're all going to be walking with Jesus and you're going to turn your head and find somebody whose kids aren't doing really well and you're going to get smug and open your mouth thinking that you really know how to raise kids when it was all Jesus. In the end, be careful. Don't put your head on a swivel. Keep it straight ahead. When you turn to the left or turn to the right, you're going to get off cadence. You're going to get out of step. And the best thing I can ever tell you is what Jesus told Peter. Peter, how about you let me be God and you be Peter? How about we... Let God be God and we be us. Just follow him. Let's pray.